Hello, and welcome to week 20 of Ari on TV. I'm Miss Jess. See what I have here? It's a little bit hard on screen, but I'm holding an ice cube. You can see when I'm holding it, it's changing. What happens to an ice cube when you hold it in your hand? It changes into a different form, right? It changes into water. The theme of this month is commitment. Last week, we explored our commitment to our conscience. And this week, we'll explore change. But first, welcome into this quiet place of beauty. We come from busy things. Pausing for a moment for the thoughts that quiet brings. Our chalice lighters this week are the Urba family. We light this chalice for the warmth of love, the light of truth, and the energy of action. So what does it mean, commitment? Commitment means that we act on what we value and hold important. That means we expect change, just like that ice is melting. When the ice was melting, was it dying or was it changing? When the ice cube turns to water, will it stop changing? Nope, it will evaporate. Almost everything keeps changing and changing all the time, including us and our ideas. We Unitarian Universalists expect change in our lives and our beliefs. What we believe at age four will change when we become eight years old. What we believe at age eight may well change when we become 12 years old. What we believe at 12 might change again when we become 20, which might change again when we're 40 or 60 or 80 years old. We believe that this is part of living and growing. We have some special guests here this week who are going to tell you all about the changes they've experienced in their faith journeys and how those changes have shaped their commitment to Unitarian Universalism. Hi, everybody. My name is Heather Swensenbrilla, and I'm a member of this congregation. Miss Jess asked me to talk to you about my religious journey and maybe how I was raised and how I ended up in our congregation. So I was raised as a Catholic, and I guess I was a Catholic because my parents were Catholic, right? And they took me to mass and I had my communion and I went through all the rituals of the church. And I don't think I remember anything that I learned in Sunday school or at mass, but I remember liking going to church and going to mass because it always felt very powerful and moving. You know, the music and the smoke and the chimes and the organ. And it felt very orderly and everybody knew what was going to happen next. And there was a sense of community. And it was very comforting, maybe not in the lessons, just in the feeling of being there. Now, when I was about 12, I think, my parents got very sick and they stopped taking me to church. So I stopped going. And I didn't really go to any church or any religion for a long time. In my teens, I had a boyfriend whose family were Buddhists and I knew nothing about this. And I saw them with their altar set up in their living room and I learned about some things they would say and I saw the way they lived and they were just really calm happy people and I sort of slowly wanted to know more about that how did you get like this um my parents had gotten sick and passed away when I was young 
And so the world was a little bit crazy for me. And I wanted something that would bring calm and understanding. And I learned more about Buddhism and I learned about karma. And they belong to a group called SGI, which is Soka Gakkai International. They were Nichiren Buddhists, which followed this, the teachings of Nichiren Daishonin. So I joined and I began chanting and I had my own altar, which is called a Butsudan in my house. And I really liked it. I liked that um, I was sort of taught that everything I needed to be happy in my life was already within me. And I had to work to find it. And it was about energy and peace and love. And all of that sort of made me feel calmer and happier as I was a teenager. Um, as I got a little older, the group that I chanted with were much older than me. And they were very into proselytizing, which means trying to convert people, trying to tell them that you should be Buddhists too. And they had brochures and we were supposed to tell people about chanting and how great it was. And the whole thing made me very uncomfortable. So I stopped going and I chanted on my own and I think it helped me, but I missed people. I missed talking about ideas with people. Um, it took me a long time to finally come to our congregation but uh, I think my journey has taken me to a place where like now as an adult, I have more control over my life. And through my Buddhist studies and my practice of chanting, I believe that there's power within me to overcome any difficulty that I can handle things. But I can also handle not knowing things. And I really like being with other people who who don't know and who are striving to know and be better people, but who are also respecting that there are lots of ways to be a better person. Um, and so here I am in our congregation and my family is here and, you know, hopefully I'll be with all of you for a very long time. Hi kids. My name is Paul. I'm a member of UUC SJS. Uh, a charter member. I helped start this congregation. And I'm going to talk to you today about my religious journey. Let's start when I was a kid. Like many of you, I was born into a Unitarian family. Uh, I went to church in Niagara Falls until I was 10 years old and we moved away. And I don't really remember anything about it other than running around the church while the, while the parents were at coffee hour. One thing I do remember though, when I was about eight years old, I went to vacation Bible school with my best friend. And she was a Southern Baptist, and they believe in things like you can't dance or play cards. They're very religious. And in this vacation at the Bible school, which I thought was really fun, while we were there doing a project, these two women brought me into a coat room, and they asked me if I knew what hell was. And I said, well, that's where the double edge, right? It's down below. Uh, they said, oh, that's right. But did you know that also uh, when you go down there, you're tortured, you're burned, your skin burns off, but it never completely burns off. And... For eternity, you're tortured by the devil. And is this a place you'd like to go? Oh, no, it doesn't sound good to me. Well, that's where you are going to go right now because you have not been saved. But we have a way that you can be saved. And they had me repeat after them, you know, declaring that Jesus was my only Lord and Savior. And they told me at the end of it, now you don't have to worry about going to hell. You've been saved. In fact, now you have two birthdays, the day you were born and the day you were saved. I went home and I told my mother about what happened and I started to cry. And at eight years old, I never cried. And I realized then that I didn't like someone telling me what to believe. And that's sort of the first time I realized the benefits of being a Unitarian Universalist. That's really sort of all I thought about religion until maybe I was 16 and in high school. I saved up my paper route money and I had a summer job when I was 15, sorting dirty laundry in a hotel and running the elevator. And it gave me enough money that when I was, for the summer when I was 16, I went and backpacked through Europe with two friends. One kid was 15 and ran away, but my, I had permission from my parents. I think they were crazy quite frankly, but they let me go. One of the things we saw a lot of in Europe uh, was religious cathedrals, artwork, including the Vatican, which is, where after the Roman Empire fell about 400 AD, you know, 1600 years ago, 
was the capital of the Catholic Church, and they sort of ruled things for hundreds of years. And it's filled with treasures of sculpture and artwork and golden artifacts and rare books. I couldn't help but thinking at 16, boy, with all the hungry, starving Catholics in the world, shouldn't you sell off some of these treasures and feed some of those people? Isn't that what Jesus would want you to do? I became sort of an atheist-leaning agnostic. An agnostic is someone who doesn't know. I considered myself a science person, and I didn't have proof there was a God. In fact, most things would indicate there wasn't. And um, But by the same token, I didn't have proof there, there wasn't a God. So I remained an agnostic. Um, in high school, one of the things you do is you start to have religious discussions with uh, people, including in our history class, we would have debates. And in that class was the minister's daughter. And the minister's daughter and I would go back and forth about, you know, what didn't make sense about religion and her end, what, you know, how did things come to be? You know, religion seeks to answer the questions, you know, what happens to you when you die? What's the purpose of humans on earth? Why is there evil? And how did, how did everything come to be? All religions seek to answer those questions, but she felt hers answered that the best. She was a very devout Christian. But she gave me a Bible and a handwritten tour sort of through the Bible, which I found very interesting and compelling. At the same time, I went to Broadway and saw the musical at the time, Jesus Christ Superstar, and I liked the way that Jesus portrayed. The whole turn the other cheek, if someone strikes you on one cheek, you know, turn and, and let them strike the other, his message of nonviolence. His message of not being judgmental, let he who has no sin cast the first stone, and uh, feeding the poor, you know, the story of the Good Samaritan and taking care of the poor. And uh, it, 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 he, he gave a message that I thought was good for humanity to listen to. And I thought, boy, if we all lived like Jesus lived, then the world would be a much better place. That said, didn't mean he was a son of God, which is the whole Unitarian thing. They believe that they believed in God and they believed in what the New Testament taught, but they thought Jesus was just a prophet like many prophets. That's the foundation of Unitarianism. So, so I got a little bit religious in my late high school years, but I was still an agnostic. When I went away to college, one of the wonderful things about college is not only that you go to amazing classes and learn amazing things, but you're there with really a lot of other smart people. And they teach you amazing things from their classes and just from their life experience. And sometimes you stay up late at night and you talk about philosophy and politics and religion. And uh, it was a wonderful time. My roommate, however, he was Catholic when I went there and really got angry with me for being agnostic. You know, either be an atheist or, or, or be a Christian, but don't, you can't be in the middle. And um, in the end, he then became an atheist. And by the time college was over, he became a Buddhist. And he's still a Buddhist to this day. And I liked the tenets of Buddhism, but I didn't know much about it in high school or college. I didn't really learn much about that until Unitarian Universalist of the South Jersey Shore. I didn't really consider religion a factor in my life. I didn't go to church. But when my kids were born and they were five and seven years old, I wanted them to get a religious education. There's a lot of different religions in the world. And it's important to a lot of people, and it motivates a lot of people in both good and bad ways. So I wanted them to have a foundation of knowledge about the different types of religion and what different people believe so that they could navigate the world more comfortably. Um, so uh, we were ready to join this church. All we had to do is say we believed in Jesus. I said, eh, I could say that. But um, the... Uh, the Unitarian, uh, I got a call that they were starting a Unitarian Universalist congregation here in South Jersey. And it was perfect because it was a perfect age for my kids. So I jumped right in. And for the next 13 years, I taught Sunday school. And I learned a ton about all different kinds of religion, Native American religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, all, all different kinds of religions, which I liked my kids being exposed to. And quite frankly, I learned a lot too. I was still an agnostic atheist leaning agnostic. And one of the things we had a lot of in our congregation was atheists. And these were very moral, good people that also thought religion was a bunch of hooey. They still attended our congregation and contributed much to it. But they didn't think that, that you needed God in life. Science was enough. But that didn't mean we shouldn't be good people and live in good ways. And I liked that. So I became more and more of an atheist leaning agnostic. Now, I don't know if you're from, uh, but I also learned about a lot about Buddhism. And I liked the whole idea of, you know, the Buddhist said that, you know, the root of all unhappiness is suffering. And if you desire less in your life, you'll suffer less. 
So, you know, watch what you want in life. And if you keep your needs modest, you'll be a happier person. Plus, he just gave you a better way to be in the world with your fellow humans and nature. And it's just a wonderful way of thinking. You don't have to think of the Buddha as a, as a religious figure. You can be what's called a secular Buddhist, where you practice the tenets of Buddhism without actually, you know, living like a monk. So, so that was very comforting. But I don't know if you're familiar with the term, there's no atheist in a foxhole. Well, an atheist, some of them doesn't believe in God. And a foxhole is a place you hide where you're getting shot at and bombed in hopes that you don't get killed. But the reason they say there's no atheist in a foxhole because when you're getting shot at and bombed, you're hoping a couple things. One, if there is a God, he's looking out for you. And two, if, if, you, know, if you die, that he's going to take you to a better place. So that's the expression, there's no atheist in a foxhole. Well, getting old is kind of like being in a foxhole. You're, you know that death is coming sooner than later. And, you know, you start to think, mm, maybe I don't want to think that when I die, I just am warm food. And that. So I, um, I still am an atheist-leaning agnostic. But I do like the idea that consciousness may live on. It's a comforting thought. Probably not true, but comforting. And learning in physics about quantum physics, um, you know, where you can take a particle and spin it, put another one way out in space, and it'll spin exactly the same as this particle, even though they're not connected. And if you stop this particle, this one will stop. Einstein called it spooky action. It is spooky. And it means that there's still a lot of things in this universe we don't understand. And I found some comfort in that. Maybe consciousness lives on. When I pray, I, when I was a kid, I prayed, God, if there is a God. Now I sort of pray to my dead ancestors, you know, mom, dad, could you give me a little wisdom here? Could you give me a little knowledge here? You're not supposed to pray for things. You're always supposed to pray for guidance and wisdom. So I try to keep myself to that. And uh, listen, it'd be nice if consciousness lives on. I doubt it, but it could be. So that's sort of my religious journey. So uh, good luck with your own religious journeys. Sorry about this pandemic. I'm sure it's been a real drag, but you'll have amazing stories to tell your grandchildren. And uh, I think if you, if you stick with the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the South Jersey Shore, you'll learn about different religions and you can pick and choose for yourself what you believe. You know, no matter what you believe, this world is a miraculous place. You look at the diversity of living things on this planet, it's incredible. I mean, it's hard not to believe in something supernatural just because of the amazing diversity of life. But, of course, there's probably a scientific explanation. I wish you all well. Take care, be well, and good luck on your religious journey. So the question of change and how we change over time, um, if in fact we do change, and, and I think most of us do change in some ways and our beliefs change. Um, I was raised as a Catholic as a young child and into my teens, um, but began to have some questions in my teen years. Um, I think I was always uh, someone who had a sense of wonder. And even as a very young child, when five or six years old, I used to lay in bed at night and think about and ponder what was there before I was born? What existed? It was hard to imagine not being alive and what was that state of before I came into the world and it used to just kind of really boggle my mind but I love to think about things like that. Uh, so growing up as a Catholic you had to kind of follow a certain number of sets of beliefs you know and doctrines they also call those belief systems. Um, and you had to go through number six, sacraments of initiation, baptism being the first. Um, when I was going through the confirmation, uh, sacrament of initiation, confirmation that was in my teen teenage years, they were speaking about baptism and how if a child, the baby died before it could be baptized, then the baby would not go to heaven and see God. The baby would not go to hell, but because that baby couldn't be baptized, and have that ritual of removing the original sin, then the baby would be in sort of a state of limbo where they might be content and happy, but not be able to see God. And I just felt that was so unfair and it just struck me as just utterly, I guess, just unfair is the, is the word that comes to mind. And I, I, it really made me begin to question. And finally, at a pretty young age, I'd say my late teens, maybe early adulthood, uh, really just uh, break completely with the Catholic Church. I just couldn't believe the things that they, they wanted me to believe. Um, and what really attracted me to the Unitarian Universalist uh, faith, the fact that it was about being a good person, about 
about living by a set of principles, all of which I believed in. Um, also about being able to search and think about things and develop new ways of thinking. Um, also, they had a lot of res they have a lot of respect for science. I mean, the beauty of science is uh, science is open to change. Um, it, although there are scientific theories that explain a lot of the things you know we know. Um, Evolution is one. It's a beautiful theory that ex explains a lot. It's still open to change and interpretation. And if someone comes along with new discoveries or makes challenges and provides new evidence, then our scientific beliefs do change. And I think that's, you know, really a, a great thing. I also had an interesting class in college called Free Will, or no, it wasn't called Free Will. It was called Science and Religion. One of the main things we discussed was the uh, debate between free will and determinism. And that's for another time, but it was a very interesting class and furthered my thinking about religion um, and science. Uh, I also want to finish by saying that um, I recently read something about um, the idea of a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. The idea of being a fixed mindset is an example would be someone who you know has beliefs and they decided they're sticking with these beliefs, they're not going to change their mind. They also have fixed beliefs about themselves, such as, um, you know, I'm not good at this, I never will be, and therefore I'm not going to try. Whereas a growth mindset is someone who's open to new ideas, um, believes they can try things, and if they work hard at something, they can learn to get better, and they can learn to aspire new, they can aspire to learn new things. And I think that's a wonderful way to live, and something that I think that we all should do is to aspire to continue to learn and grow throughout our lives. Hi everybody, I'm Steve McGahey, um, Tara's dad. Uh, Jessica asked me to speak a little bit about my beliefs and how they've changed over time. Um, I understand change is an important principle in Unitarianism. I'm rel relatively new to that, so if I don't seem like an expert, that's probably why. Uh, I was brought up in a United Methodist Church. My father was a minister, so was, um, everything in my life revolved around the church. Went to church Sunday school, uh, sang in the choir. We liked the candles in the service, um, Bible studies. We cleaned the church. We mowed the lawn, cleaned the toilets, all kind of things like that. So um, very heavily involved. Um, also, there was this thing as a preacher's kid, you have to sort of maintain this image uh, that you can't make mistakes in public, you can't act uh, in any way that might reflect badly on my father or the, the church or my family or something like that. So it was, was kind of heavy, kind of oppressive, you might say. So I was, I kind of rebelled in certain ways. And one of the ways I rebelled was asking a lot of questions. I gave my teachers a really hard time, my Sunday school teachers a hard time when, you know, I'd find some kind of contradiction in something that was said. Um, and that was... Uh, when I got to college, I took some religious studies courses and got kind of different perspectives. And I, I found this book at one point in a bookstore uh, called Meditation in Action. And it was by a Tibetan Buddhist teacher uh, named Chogyam Chungpa Rinpoche. And one of my favorite lines from the book is, in Buddhism, concepts are generally regarded as a hindrance. And I had been getting all caught up in concept. Does God exist? Does God exist outside of me? Is he inside of me? <clears throat> you know, is if God is all powerful and all loving, why why does he let so much suffering happen in the world? And then, you know, kind of thinking kind of thoughts like that, which are about the concept, making God into a thing that is, you know, your mind can kind of get a handle on. So Buddhism kind of says, well, concepts are helpful, but they're not the real thing. Um so I about six or seven years after that, I connected with the Shambhala Center in Philadelphia, and I learned how to meditate, and I really connected with the meditation practice. Uh, meditation is about kind of sitting with yourself in a sort of non-judgmental way. A lot of times we have thoughts that we like or thoughts we don't like, and our mind gets kind of hooked on those. And just kind of sitting and not allowing your mind to keep following those thoughts was very refreshing, very helpful, kind of helps you kind of uh, gain what we kind of we, we call sanity, a kind of better way of being in the world. Uh, so that was very helpful. Uh, at some point uh, when I was uh, 
we had Tara and we wanted her to have some kind of religious education and the, the Shambhala Center wasn't offering anything so we, we started going to the Unitarian Church. And the Unitarian, that sort of focus in the Unitarian Church in terms of social action has, has been kind of interesting and helpful for us. <clears throat> Yvette had told me when we first met, you mean, you know Yvette, she was from Mexico, and she told me that we are from different, we are different races, and I didn't really think so at first. I'm white, I know that's not part of my experience, <clears throat> but I learned <clears throat> from her that, you know, the way she, things she experiences in her daily life are very different from what I experience. And, uh, so, uh, I, I wanted the Shambhala Center to, to focus, do some programs around that. It was a little bit hard to get people lined up because no one thinks it's a problem, but no, you know, now, of course, it's very obvious to a lot of people that it's a problem. So and I'm glad that the Unitarian Church is involved in that. My dad was very clear that spirituality and politics were, were different things. He did not preach politics. He preached you know, a relationship with God, you know, getting forgiveness of your sins, experiencing God's love and grace and letting that into your heart. That's kind of his focus. So politics was more of a distraction. He felt churches that get too caught up in politics are really kind of missing the point, which is just sort of a transcendence. I think this quality of transcending our worldly situations is really the basis of both Buddhism and, and Christianity. So I see a lot of commonalities, loving your neighbor as yourself, cultivating compassion in Buddhism. Um, and out of that sanity that we cultivate, you take you can take appropriate action. You don't add confusion into the world. So I think the Unitarian focus on, on social action has been helpful to me uh, in sort of turning turning my focus more outward and um, the things that we can actually do in the world to make a difference. So I hope this is helpful. I hope uh, I support anybody who is open to change and wants to, to, to explore things. So. That's great. Good luck. I hope this has been helpful. Hi, my name is Angela Wexler, and I'm a member, I've been a member of this congregation for over 10 years. Before that, I was a member of a congregation in Gloucester County, and that's where I raised my three daughters. Presently, I serve as secretary of the Board of Trustees because we as Unitarians feel that it's important to participate in our community. And for last year and this year, that's my source of particip participation. I wasn't brought up a Unitarian. I was brought up in the Catholic Church. Fortunately, my parents were not such severe uh, religious people that they expected me to believe that everything that they did. So I was able at a young age and then through college to evolve my beliefs. Uh, one of the things that I find different from the way I was brought up in the Catholic Church and actually went to Catholic school, is that there is a God. I no longer believe that there is one God. I no longer believe that God will punish us if we don't do good things, if, 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 if we do bad things. Um, we do good things because it's the right thing to do. And I think as Unitarians, that's one of our basic beliefs, is that we do good because it's the right thing to do. Uh, another belief I no longer hold is the idea of sin. Now, sin is something you do that's bad, and um, somehow you're going to pay for it later on. Uh, my husband and I often joke that the only Unitarian sin is to not recycle. But as we know, we recycle because it's the right thing to do, because we care about the earth. It's one of our principles. Uh, your uh, Miss Jess also asked if I would um, talk about how maybe my beliefs have changed over the years. And I'll have to say, I, I don't think they've changed so much as they have evolved, is that uh, the older I've gotten and the more I talk to Unitarians who have many different ideas, the more I'm able to open my mind and kind of see things from somebody else's perspective. I don't always agree with them, but at times I can nod and say, Hmm, that's an idea. That's something I hadn't thought of before. And again, I think we as Unitarians try to do that more than people from other faiths. Have the people I met here shaped my beliefs? Yes, to the extent that we're always discussing. We're always thinking about other ideas. We always have uh, Sunday morning services that invite other people to share their ideas. So 
they have evolved that way. Being, in a, being a Unitarian often means stepping back from the world, looking out at things, and deciding for yourself through science, through discussion, through learning, how you might believe about things or how you might act on things. So even as an older person in the, our Unitarian congregation, there's always something new to learn. That's all I have to say. Bye-bye. Did you see some familiar faces? What did you think about their stories? Just like the ice cube, their beliefs have changed over time. The ice cube might be changing, melting into water or evaporating, but it will always have hydrogen and oxygen molecules, whether it's ice, water, or steam. Let's pretend for a moment our commitments are like molecules. Curiosity, change, conscience, compassion. These have always been there in some form in our faith, but our understandings, our language, what we leave out, and what we include changes. I'm going to tell you about four ways that our faith has changed as our understandings change just like that ice cube, and just like our guests and their personal stories. Right now, we have a change to consider, that of adding an eighth principle to our seven principles. We're learning more and more about racism and have grown and understand racism in ways that have changed. Our eighth principle, which has already been adopted by a number of congregations, tells us we the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote, journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. Another change, change number two, we changed our second source to reflect a new sensitivity to gender identity. We have learned and grown in our understanding that there are many genders, not just male and female. So we changed our language from words and deeds of prophetic men and women, which challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love to words and deeds of prophetic people, which challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. The third change, we added the sixth source, spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions, which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. And that was added in 1987. Before that, Unitarian Universalists didn't understand how important these Earth-centered traditions were to spiritual life. The fourth change I want to tell you about, if we go even further back, we see how our understandings have changed too. One of the older principles from 1961, when Unitarian and Universalism were merged, said, to encourage cooperation with men of goodwill in every land. The compassion was there, but in those days, the word men was supposed to include everyone, but it really didn't. So now we use the word humankind instead of mankind. Our world has changed since then, and we made the change in our faith and in our language. We're going to take a minute to listen to a song together called Wo Ya Ya. While we listen to this song together, think about the changes you have in, had in your life and in how you maybe think about things as you've gotten older. We can expect all sorts of changes in our lives. Sometimes it isn't easy to change, but that's why we Unitarian Universalists are in it together. We have to help each other, not only be open to change, but also to help each other adjust, let go and embrace what's new. Yep, we all change, but we're all in it together.
That's a pretty popular song for a lot of UU congregations, though our congregation doesn't sing it very often. It's a good one, though. Well, that's it for our show this week. As you go out into the world, notice the changes happening around you. Spring's on the horizon, and there are little changes happening in nature right now. Notice the changes happening in your life. Now, with COVID vaccinations happening, there might be fewer restrictions coming soon on the things we want to do. Notice the changes in you, in your thoughts, in your feelings, in your beliefs. We are a people committed to change. Embrace those changes. Have faith and remember to follow your conscience. And don't forget to visit our RE Virtual Lab for more fun and learning. Until next time, blessed be my loves. <laughs>